One of the things that was hard for me when I started this was to let people pick their own path. Um, been a paramedic firefighter for 25 years, and when they call me, um, they want me to tell them what to do. It's my job to go in and say, do this, do this, do this, we're going to do this, and I'm going to save your life. And in branching out into helping people find their way to recovery, learning that, um, first of all, not everybody wants recovery, not everybody's ready for recovery, and that everybody has their own path, and it may not look like the path that I have, has been a huge learning curve for me. So the fact that you guys are here, and you're learning about naloxone, and you're willing to have it, administer it, maybe where you, where you work, uh, is a very big deal, because keeping people alive in case they relapse or in case they have an overdose is very important for their recovery. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, next up is Andrew Swanson, right? All right, and he's actually the uh, Policy and Advocacy Director for Oregon Recovers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Swanson. Um, I am the Policy and Advocacy Director of Oregon Recovers, and what that means is I spend a lot of time working with our state legislators, our local uh, city and county elected officials to advance addiction policy in the state of Oregon. Um, <clears throat> first, before I dive into everything I'm going to talk about, I just wanted to kind of gauge the audience. Uh, could you raise your hand if you uh, know somebody close to you that has suffered from the disease of addiction, either currently or have, have in the past? Okay, cool. Now raise your hand if you know somebody who's in recovery. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But I want to see everybody's hand raised the next time we come and do this. Um, so Oregon Recovers is a statewide advocacy organization, uh, and we're a coalition of people in recovery. Um, you know, the people that love us, our friends and family members, and the people that take care of us. So the folks working on the front lines of the addiction crisis. Uh, and our mission is to transform Oregon's current fractured and incomplete addiction recovery system into a recovery-oriented continuum of care. It recognizes addiction as a chronic disease requiring a lifetime of attention. That's a mouthful, but it's really important to point out fractured and incomplete. We are not saying failed. There's a lot of really good work being done all over the state of Oregon, um, but it's very much siloed. You know, there is no comprehensive continuum in which different agencies and providers are communicating and providing warm handoffs, and that's really what we need to see in order to, to deal with this crisis. Um, here's just a, a short list of some of our partners. It's not, you know, uh, the full list, but I do want to point out Clackamas County is on there, Bridges to Change, uh, and you know some of the other counties local from the Tri-County area, as well as some of the largest foundations in Oregon. Uh, we are in, in our infancy. We've been around for th a little over three years now, and in, in that first year, we managed to receive funding from three out of the four largest foundations in Oregon, and I really think that that speaks to the need for something like what we're doing here in Oregon. Um, why we exist, you know, it's, it's pretty clear. It's already been stated uh, by, by last, the last couple of presenters. But uh, we, and these stats are actually, we just got our new SAMHSA report, so I'll alter those. Oregon actually ranks 47th in access to treatment. However, our access didn't get any better. It's just some states got worse. Um, <laughs> we currently have the third highest untreated addiction rate in the country. Okay, and five Oregonians die a day from alcohol-related deaths, whereas one to two Oregonians die daily from drug overdoses. I just want to point that out again. Five times as many people die from alcohol in the state of Oregon as all drug overdoses combined. Okay, and that is not to diminish drug overdoses by, by any stretch of the imagination. I, I am in recovery from, from, you know, from heroin, uh, and I lost a lot of friends to this, to this disease. However, uh, we need to start thinking uh, about this issue as... Oregon has an addiction crisis, not an opioid crisis, not a methamphetamine crisis, an addiction crisis. And until we start to look at the, the you know, uh, underlying uh, impacts and the, and the societal drivers that are causing this, we're not really going to get anywhere. It's just going to replace one to another. And April even pointed out, we're kind of seeing the beginning wave of a methamphetamine crisis here in Oregon. So, <clears throat> oh, also, real quick, over 2,100 Oregonians are going to die this year from drugs and alcohol, and not to diminish the AIDS epidemic, but at the height of the AIDS epidemic, 360-some-odd uh, people died. So that's a 700% increase. Just to put this crisis, this emergency, you know, in into perspective for folks, like we, we have never really addressed this crisis 
um, at, at the level that we need to or recognize how severe it is. So organ recovers, um, from the beginning, we you know, opted to try and reduce organs addiction rate and increase our recovery rate. Uh, and we've actually worked with Oregon Health Authority to establish the, the first, we're the first state in the country to establish a statewide recovery rate so we can start to measure success there. Uh, and we uh, pushed for the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission, which is a statewide uh, governor appointed commission that's been tasked with coming up with a statewide strategic plan to address addiction. Um, they've adopted these two objectives. And anybody who's familiar with government for that level of accountability to be adopted by a statewide agency dealing with addiction was really encouraging. Um, here's just uh, some of the highlights of what we've done in, in the three years we've been around. And again, I just want to kind of point out the reason we exist is in Oregon, there has never been an organized political constituency of the recovery community that drives policy change. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Obviously, a lot of folks have participated in 12-step programs, which are, you know, by design anonymous, which makes it inherently challenging to organize those people. Um, and, you know, there's a few trade organizations and things representing different treatment providers, but no overall statewide political constituency, and we're really trying to change that. Um, so <clears throat> we... You know, one of the first things we did in 2018 is we got the governor to declare addiction a public health crisis in Oregon. And we had a House bill passed, House Bill 4137, which set a series of deadlines for the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission to actually get moving on a plan and get this, you know, together. It also provided them with $250,000 to come up with a plan. We had the executive director, uh, a new ED put in there. And then in the last legislative session, we... <clears throat> passed another House bill that further strengthened the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission by bringing in non-voting member, a representative from the CCO, as well as legislative representation uh, to just continue to build this coalition of folks that are actively engaged in coming up with this, with this planning process. Um, we also, uh, more recently, in, the, in uh, September, which is National Recovery Month for anybody who doesn't know that, um, we had a series of city and county resolutions around the state passed by local advocates. So we weren't picking up the phone and calling county commissioners. Our, our local folks in, in each of these counties and cities worked you know, with their local elected officials to get resolutions passed at the city and county level declaring addiction to public health crisis in their community and asking their state legislators to do something about it. So it's that kind of grassroots organizing work throughout the state that's, that we've really been focused on. Uh, Event-wise, you know, one of the most important things, but to my point of like, you know, kind of a fundamental lack of organization around this issue is we need to build out that community, you know, bring people together from different pathways to recovery. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with 12-step programs, but we have a lot of other pathways to recovery that are often not really highlighted. Things like refuge, refuge recovery, well, bribery within the Native American community, um, smart recovery, and so on and so forth. So like a lot of our work has been, you know, creating events that are all inclusive, that celebrate people's recovery and bring people from every different corner of the recovery community together and kind of break those silos down so that we can kind of unify around our common goal of increasing recovery and reducing addiction in Oregon. <clears throat> so those are the four Walk for Recovery events we did in September this year. Um, the previous September, we had one in Portland where I think uh, like 900 people turned out in downtown Portland and walked through you know, downtown streets on a Saturday afternoon to celebrate recovery. This year, we organized four around the state in the four largest media markets. These were strategically planned to align with those resolutions passing the previous week. So we managed to generate like 30 news stories around the state uh, covering this. And, and as I'm sure you're all aware, like if you want to see movement with elected officials, particularly at the state level, get it in the media, you know, get press attention to this issue and keep it going. And so a lot of the, the you know, community organizing and community building events we do are very, very focused on, you know, identifying the audience we're trying to, to speak to and, and, you know, generating a lot of media buzz. Um, <clears throat> I already covered the movement building stuff. That would be the resolutions. But yeah, you know, the, in addition to educating our local elected officials, those resolutions had the other really cool um, effect of we're training advocates, we're building advocacy leadership in each of these regions around the state. These are folks just like me who come from a, a criminal justice background, like, you know, have a criminal history, uh, you know, are in relatively early recovery, probably never had any good experiences in any kind of government building. And now they're going into city hall, they're developing relationships with their local elected officials. They're, you know, they're, they're 
learning to use their voice to, to empower themselves in their community. And that is um, personally extremely rewarding to see, but it also, that means that you know when these county and city officials move on up into the state legislature in a few years, we will have those relationships. We're building sustained advocacy capacity uh, across the state. So why am I here today? Um, other than the fact that I work at Oregon Recovers, uh, I just celebrated three years last November in recovery. I, thank you. I was an IV heroin and methamphetamine addict. And by the way, I use the word addict and addiction because I work in advocacy. So I'm trying to get people moving. I'm trying to incite a response. I want to see people's visceral response to get angry, to get vocal about this issue. And SUD doesn't really have the same, you know, phonetic drive as, as the word addiction. But, um, you know, I, I stole cars. I lived on Skid Row in Los Angeles. I did whatever I had to do uh, to survive in that lifestyle for many years. And I survived a number of overdoses. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you straight up, if it wasn't for people accessing naloxone through harm reduction services like syringe exchanges in, in Los Angeles, I would be dead right now. So first of all, I want to thank you guys for being here today. And I, you know, if you don't, if you didn't get your naloxone kit yet, make sure you do before you leave because uh, you never know who or when you know, that's going to be needed. Uh, there were a number of cases where, I, I mean, in one, in one situation, I keeled over on the sidewalk, right? And, and you know, if somebody with naloxone had been passing by, they wouldn't have had to call the paramedics and I would, have been, would not have been footed with that massive medical bill. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, I do the work I'm doing. I had access to a lot of resources. I, you know, I'm very fortunate in the sense that I had a family that was willing to, to, to help me get into treatment several times. And I really want to just really drive home the point that relapse is part of recovery, okay? To expect perfection after a 30-day spin-dry cycle of, of residential treatment is something that we would not expect of any other chronic disease, all right? And the, the more understanding and compassionate of approach we can, we can bring to the table when dealing with people with, with substance use disorder, the more likely they are to succeed. So, so just know that, you know, it took me six years of in and out of treatment and I, gosh, I don't even know, maybe seven different treatment goes, multiple detoxes before I was really able to access recovery. Um, that's not by any stretch of the imagination like the, the, the median or the standard, that's just my story. Um, but, you know, I don't know very many people that act, like got into recovery the first time they ever tried, right? Like it, it, is, it is a chronic relapsing disease and we need to understand that and respect that and help people meet them where they're at, right? I'm a huge advocate for harm reduction services and practicing harm reduction principles in all you know, different pillars of, of a real continuum of care. And um, when I say continuum of care, what I'm talking about is prevention, like a robust, well-funded prevention system, um, a new intervention an engagement paradigm that is not centered in our criminal justice system, but is centered in our primary care system so that we can reach people and engage them before they end up in the criminal justice system. Treatment on demand and recovery support services. So the, the other really important thing to know here, we've already learned about prevention, we've learned about uh, treatment. Recovery is really where the work starts, right? Like this is a chronic disease and you have to deal with this in a chronic way. You can't leave treatment and expect that you're somehow cured. Um, because you're not. The most important thing I did for my recovery in my life was when I got out of treatment, I immediately immersed myself in a recovery community and I stayed there and I'm still there today. Um, it is, you know, a, <clears throat> for me today, that means I go to, you know, one meeting a week, but I'm actively sponsoring multiple people. I work obviously in recovery, so I'm surrounded by people in recovery. Um, but, you know, it, it is, the most important part of my life, and I have to continue to believe that it is if I'm going to stay sober and clean. Um, so in order to build a, like a real comprehensive continuum of care in Oregon, and I'm just going to go out there and say this, we need revenue. So you know, if you're talking to folks, start talking about like how we as a state can really craft policy that's going to be able to change the system. It needs to be dedicated revenue. We can't fund a real continuum of care if it's, if it's you know, uh, incremental amounts from the general fund in, in each governor's uh, budget cycle. Like, that's not going to fly. We need to go after where the real money is. So just food for thought here, a price increase on the lowest beer tax in the country could effectively fund a real continuum of care, and we could see really effective, you know, increase in services here in Oregon and save a lot of lives. Um, 
I think that's it. Oh yeah, recovery support centers. Uh, I just threw these, these four up there really quickly, um, but I'd be happy to talk to you guys afterwards if there's other recovery support centers, you know, if you live in some other area and you know, I'd be happy to connect you with people. Yes. Drunk driving. Yeah, it, it included both. Both. Yes, yes it does. Um, and that's why I, I said as a result of drugs and alcohol, not untreated addiction specifically, because, you know, uh, you don't need to be, uh, you don't need to be diagnosed with an SED to kill somebody with your car if you're drunk or high, right? Like that, uh, that happens either way. Um, so again, recovery support centers, and we are super fortunate here in, in this part of Oregon. We have access to a lot of really great places. Uh, the Alano Club in Fourth Dimension would be two that I'm very familiar with. Fourth Dimension Recovery Center is youth focused, so it's folks like 18 to 30 or thereabout. Um, and you know, that's one of the biggest challenges for young people trying to access recovery is going to a, a, a church basement AA meeting where you're like the youngest person by 30 years does not make recovery appealing, right? Like it, it's they're very very tied to their social network, uh, and having a place like Fourth Dimension where they offer uh, not only peer services but a, a variety of meetings. They also offer a lot of events. You know, they do a lot of things together. They're, they're very engaged in the community. Um, that provides that, that added social network that's really important to, to younger folks. The Alana Club of Portland also has been pioneering a lot of really cool uh, new programs. Um, both do a lot of peer services, but the Alana Club also does like, you know, expungement clinics to help people remove some of the felonies. They work with the, the Multnomah County Public Defender's Office to remove felonies from folks' records so they can better access, uh, you know, employment. They have a CrossFit gym that's free to anybody who's in recovery. Like, people are starting to recognize that recovery and recovery sports services means more than just going to an AA meeting, right? It means creating that social network for you, that support network. It means um, you know, addressing other inequities within your behavior or lifestyle, like becoming healthier, quitting smoking, like I did, you know, like all of those things are huge to my recovery and it's all, they're all very important, eating healthier, hiking, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was probably a little quick there, but uh, if you, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>